How do you know? How do you know? That's the question uh, for this morning. And some things for you to think about. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a broken fan belt and a leaky tire. You know, how true is that? Always remember that you're unique, just like everyone else. If you think nobody cares if you're alive, try missing a couple of car payments. If at first you don't succeed, skydiving is not for you. Some days you're the windshield, some days you're the bug. The quickest way to double your money is to fold it in half and put it back in your pocket. Never, under any circumstances, take a sleeping pill and a laxative on the same night. And finally, never claim to be a Christian if you do not love one another. Never claim to be a Christian if you do not love one another. How do you identify a Christian? How do you know that someone is a Christian? Reverend Tim Kennedy uh, tells about traveling in Israel one summer, and there was a, a bus tour of Israel. And uh, during one part of the journey, the bus driver took a big plastic sign out from behind his seat and put it up in the passenger side window of the bus. And it was in Arabic, so Pastor Kennedy couldn't, uh, couldn't read it, so he asked the tour guide what it said. And the tour guide translated, he said, this is an Arab bus, that's what the sign said, this is an Arab bus, owned and operated by Arabs, please do not throw stones. Well, when they got close to Tel Aviv, the driver pulled another sign out from behind his seat, another plastic sign, put it in the window on the passenger side, and this one was in Hebrew, and so Pastor Kennedy didn't know Hebrew, he asked the the, uh, guide to translate, and uh, the guide translated it, so in Hebrew it said, this is a Jewish bus. Owned and operated by Israelis. Please do not throw stones. How do you tell the difference between an Arab bus and a Isra- you know, uh, Jewish bus? By the plastic sign in the window, I suppose. And I, and I do remember when I was in uh, Israel, this was many years ago, uh, I was on a, a bus, a tour bus that was driven by a Palestinian driver, and we had a Jewish tour guide. And everyone, they got along fine. Uh, and tourists uh, were, were very safe when we were traveling there in the Middle East. But my conclusion was that people are just trying to do their best to survive, trying to do their best to make a living. There wasn't the, the conflict, and I think that's still probably the case for most of the people who live in that area. But back to our main question, how do you know, how do you know if a person is a Christian? Do we, put, do we wear plastic signs? Would that really make a difference? You know, I'm a Christian. You know, does that make a difference to, to people if we would advertise it that way? And I think it's an important question. How do you know? How do you know? Who we are speaks so loud that people really can't even hear what we're saying. Who we are is what makes a difference. We've seen what's happened to the Christian church in Europe. Many of the grand cathedrals are empty. Older members just barely hanging on. What what is the cause of that? And and is that what the future holds for, for us even in this country? Do you remember back before Easter when Notre Dame, uh, Notre Dame Cathedral caught on fire? And, and it was riveting to watch that. It, it, was, it was sad uh, to watch the fire up on the roof and in that spire, and eventually to watch that come crashing down. In fact, there were times as I was watching that that they were uh, fearful that the whole cathedral would just collapse in on itself. And, of course, that didn't happen, thankfully, and news reports have said that really – in the overall scheme of things, the damage was relatively minor. It's going to take a long time to rebuild, but the organ uh, survived. Those beautiful stained glass windows uh, survived and all of those things. But did you hear the, the reports? People were upset, of course, and it gathered a lot of attention on the streets there around uh, Notre Dame there in, in Paris. A lot of people were riveted to, to watching the drama unfold. And as reporters were there, they would interview people. There were very few people, though, that would say, I'm sad because my church is on fire. Did you hear what people were saying? Notre Dame Cathedral, it was sad because it was a, it was a, a place that tourists like to go to. It was, a, it was a landmark. But it wasn't necessarily a place of worship for most of the people. They were sad because they were, they were losing one of the landmarks of the city. That's the difference, I think, that we see between a secular society that is much the way it is in France and and a more religious society. I'm not going to say that that's much the way it is in in our country anymore, Uh, but you can see the, the change. 
How did it happen that the church became so irrelevant in people's lives? How does that happen? Maybe it's because who we are speaks so loud that people can't hear our words. We might say we're Christians, but if we don't demonstrate that, by the way we live, what would people be attracted to? And, and even when we are in mission, sometimes we give the wrong, the wrong message. There was a young man, a teenager in his youth group. Uh, he told his father of this great activity that their youth group was going to do. This is in Cleveland, Ohio. And they were going to go out and they were going to hand blankets, hand out blankets to the homeless. And in Cleveland, the winters can, can become pretty brutal. And so it was a great thing to do. But the young man, in his excitement, said to his dad, We're passing out blankets so we can tell them about Jesus. His father... Uh, very simply corrected him. He said, we don't give blankets to the homeless to tell them about Jesus. We give blankets to the homeless because they're cold. You know, what, what we do is, is so important. You understand the difference? If we're motivated by the idea of somehow making our church a bigger church, then our witness is going to ring very false. But if, on the other hand, we're motivated simply by our desire to share what we have received from Jesus, then the world will, will gladly hear that. And Jesus said that his followers can be identified by their love. We can be identified as the followers of Jesus by our love and the love that we share with one another. Not by our clothes, not by the bumper stickers that we have on our cars, not by our jewelry, not by the places that we live, but by our love. In the Bible reading that Lynn read for us, Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Isn't that a great word? By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. He doesn't say, by this, everyone's going to know you're my disciples, if you tell them. No, you've got to love them. You've got to love them. And, and it's amazing how many people miss that and, and miss the importance of that, that how, how central that is to our faith. We are those who are called to love the world for whom Christ died. A street minister in Chicago tells the story of a young woman who came into his homeless shelter. Uh, she, was, uh, she was sick. She was frightened. She was, she was feeling guilty. And she told, she told her story. She told about drug addiction and prostitution, how she had even uh, abused uh, her, her, uh, her little two-year-old child. The street pastor was just, he was stunned with the story that she was telling. And, and finally, he asked her if she had ever thought of going to, going to a church for help. She got this amazed look on her face. She said, church, why would I ever go there? They'll make me feel worse than I already do. You know, obviously... Obviously, the people that she identified as Christians did not pass the love test. And that's troubling, isn't it? They'll know we are Christians by our love. I went to a youth group training one time, and uh, it was a youth training event. And the, the theme of the event and the main question of the event was, would your church or your youth group welcome the youth that other churches don't want? Would your church welcome the people that other churches don't want? And the focus of that whole day was on how uh, youth in our communities are hurting, how they're, how they're broken. And you know what their, their conclusion was? All youth, all youth are hurting. And, you know, we might even be able to expand that. All, all people, all of us are hurting. All of us have sinned and fallen short. All of us have difficulties in our lives. And I, and I wonder if God isn't calling us to meet those needs, to reach out to people who are hurting. That's what we're called to do. Jesus said, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And do you know where these words are found in John's Gospel? When we do uh, Bible reading the way we do it and just project up those few verses, you don't get the context of where it appears. But it actually comes in John's Gospel, right between where Jesus predicts his betrayal by Judas and his denial by Peter. It comes right in the midst of that. So this isn't just some calm time that Jesus is teaching 
This is a difficult time in Jesus' life and ministry. He knows where he's going. He knows what's going to happen. And so in the midst of that, he's telling his disciples this important lesson. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. In the midst of what Jesus was facing, he wanted to challenge his disciples, challenge his closest friends, his closest followers to love one another. And I think that's what Jesus is challenging us to do as well. Love one another as I have loved you. And let me say uh, one, one final thing that's, that's very critical. When we go out to minister to the least and the lowest in Jesus' names, and, and, and we do that, that's what our missions are all about. When we go out to minister to the least and lowest in Jesus' name, we don't do it. We don't do it to save their souls. We do it to save our own. A young man was converted uh, to Christ during his senior year in high school. And this is the story. He tells it in his own words. He says, I was a fresh, eager Christian. So when Tony Campolo came to our town to speak, I went to hear him. He was great. After he spoke, he asked us to sign up for his program of inner city ministry in Philadelphia that summer. And so I did. Um, just an aside, you know, many of you are familiar with Tony Campolo. He is from the Philadelphia area, uh, was a professor down at Eastern College for many years. I think he's mostly retired now. If you ever had a chance to hear him speak, he was a tremendously motivational speaker. He could have you laughing in one moment and crying the next moment, but really getting his point across. I just uh, have always loved the stories that, that, he, uh, that he told. Anyway, this, uh, this young man continues his story. Well, in mid-June... I met about 100 other kids in a Baptist church in Philadelphia. We had about an hour of singing before Dr. Campolo arrived. When he got to the church, we were really worked up. We were enthusiastic, ready to go. And Dr. Campolo, he preached for about an hour. And then when he finished, people were shouting. They were standing on the pews. They were clapping. It was great. Okay, gang, are you ready to go out there and tell them about Jesus? Dr. Campolo asked. Yeah, let's go, we shouted back. Get on the bus. Tony shouted. So we spilled out of the church and onto the bus. We were singing and clapping, but then we began to drive deeper into the depths of the city. We weren't in a great neighborhood when we started, but it got worse. Gradually, we stopped singing, and all of us college kids were just staring out the windows. We were scared. And then the bus pulled up in front of one of the worst looking housing projects in Philadelphia. Tony jumped on the bus and said, all right, gang, get out there and tell them about Jesus. I'll be back at five o'clock. We made our way off the bus hesitantly. We stood there on the corner and had a prayer, and then we spread out. I walked down the sidewalk and stopped before a huge apartment building. I gulped, said a prayer, went inside. There was a terrible odor. Windows were broken, no lights in the hall. I walked up one flight of stairs and toward a door where I heard a baby crying. I knocked on the door. Who is it? said a loud voice inside. Then the door cracked open, and a woman holding a naked baby looked out at me. What do you want? she asked in a mean voice. I told her that I wanted to tell her about Jesus. With that, she swung the door open and began cursing me. She cursed me all the way down the hall, down the steps, and out onto the sidewalk. I felt terrible. Look at me, I said to myself. Some Mr. Christian I am. How in the world could somebody like me think I could tell people about Jesus? I sat down on the curb and cried. Then I looked up and noticed the store on the corner. Windows all boarded up, bars over the door. I went to the store. I walked in and looked around. Then I remembered. The baby had no diapers. The mother was smoking. I bought a box of disposable diapers and a pack of cigarettes. I walked back to the apartment house, said another prayer, walked in and up the flight of stairs. I gulped, stood at the door and knocked. Who is it? growled the voice inside. When she opened the door, I slid the box of diapers and the cigarettes in. She looked at them, then looked at me and said, come in. I stepped into the dingy apartment. Sit down, she commanded. I sat down on the old sofa and began to play with the baby. I put a diaper on the baby, even though I had never put a diaper on a baby before in my life. 
When the woman offered me a cigarette, even though I don't smoke, I smoked. I stayed there all afternoon talking, playing with the baby, listening to the woman. About four o'clock, the woman looked at me and said, let me ask you something. What's a nice college boy like you doing in a place like this? So I told her everything I knew about Jesus. It took all the five minutes. Then she said, pray for me and for my baby that we can make it out of here alive. And I prayed. That afternoon, after we were all back on the bus, Tony asked, Well, gang, did any of you get to tell him about Jesus? And I said, I not only got to tell him about Jesus, I met Jesus. I went out to save somebody, and I ended up getting saved. And that's the way it is. That's the way it is. There are so many people who bear the name of Christ... Talk about being a Christian who have never met Christ because they've never seen Christ in their neighbor. How can you identify a Christian? How can you tell? How do you know? There's only one way. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love one another. That's what Jesus calls us to do. That's what Jesus challenges us to do. And that's my challenge for for each of us here, for myself, for all of us. We're called to love one another. It's one thing to talk about being a Christian. Oh, I'm a Christian. I, I follow Jesus. It's another thing to demonstrate that and the love that we share with one another. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for for this day and for this reminder that you give us that that great command that everyone will know, everyone will know that we are your disciples, we are your followers, by the way we love one another. Help us to live up to that calling, Lord. Help us to to reach out to those who are hurting, to those who are troubled. And help us to do more than just talk about our faith. Help us to live out our faith, to demonstrate that faith, so that somehow we can share Jesus with the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.